Meet Geek Gab Show, a regular vlog where I get to yak about news and reviews focused on video games, electronics, sci-fi, fantasy movies, TV shows, comic books, collectibles, and other geeky topics. Oh, hello. Uh, this is the Meek Geek, owner of official VGO videos representing NASAFNetwork.com. Welcome to the Meek Geek Gap Show, a uh, geeky show where I talk about uh, video games, science fiction, comic books, rock, the latest punk rock groups, or whatever rock groups are available in uh, that, I'm, that I enjoy watching or listening to, or any just about anything that is uh, geeky and, and interesting. Um, I'm going to try something a little different. I'm going to be reading from a friend, a friend on Facebook. Uh, he provided me his his ebook, Outlaws. His name is Nick San. I'll be reading chapter one, but I'll be I'll also be reading the other chapters in future episodes. So stay tuned. So as we can see, this is the book Outlaws, Nick Sand. Uh, you can purchase this uh, ebook on Amazon.ca. Make sure to click the link below. You'll see a link included in this video where you can purchase this this book for your own, for your own enjoyment now here is the front cover uh, it's, it's a tough guy with a powerful rifle on an alien planet let's get right to the reading outlaws a science fiction novel by Nick sand triple w .com. outlaws copyright 2012 by Nick San, all rights reserved. Author's note, this book is a work of fiction. Names, characters, places, and incidents are products of the author's imagination or are used fictitiously. Any resemblance to actual events or locals or persons living or dead is entirely coincidental. The scanning, uploading, and distribution of this book via the internet or any other means without the permission of the publisher, which I do have permission, by the way, is illegal and punishable by law. Please purchase only authorized electronic editions and do not participate in or encourage electronic piracy of copyrighted materials. Your support of the author's rights is appreciated. Find Nick San online at www.nicksan.com. Layout provided by Everything Indie. www.everything-indie.com. I'll be right back. All right, I had to close the door because I didn't want to disturb my roommates. Um, just want to reiterate: we're, we're we're reading from Outlaws by Nick Sand, a science fiction novel, chapter one. Let's get to chapter one here. <clears throat> chapter one: Galileo the Third was a ship from Earth, not the Earth that exploded in the 26th century due to an asteroid knocking it off its orbit around the sun. That earth has become the place of myth and legends. The inhabitants of that, of that were transported to earth, too, have all died out, and the new generations tell stories of heroic soldiers, likes no planet has ever seen, who battled adversaries so evil, even their lineage was severed to prevent any descendants from emerging in the future. There were intellectual giants, artistic geniuses, and business masterminds. Earth, one, had all these things, as many planets in the expanding universe do. Earth, two, is now a central hub of business where other planets from faraway galaxies come to trade just about anything from spices to textiles to intellectual properties. At the south southernmost pole is a stretch of land uncharted and occupied by the rest of the planet, a desolate place ignored by the Interstellar Police Federation (IPF), who monitor the arrivals and departures of ships into Earth, the Earth Two atmosphere as well as the surrounding three space stations. The IPF is the strong arm of the Algamated Planetary Pact that dictates the rules of engagement importations, exportation, and financial exchange regulations of the planets in several galaxies. They are also the clean-up crew 
called when illegal activities are reported. So far, the Galileo III has not appeared on the IPF radar once in over eight years of flights. From the outside, Galileo looks like any other cargo holder from a dozen different systems. <clears throat> its radiation reading, shield capability, and core temperature would all register it as a typical holder. That is how Harmon designed it. She was the ship's mechanic. A giant Amazon of a female who claimed no planet to be her, her home. But her features, a pug nose, thick white hair that she wore to her waist, and the slightest appearance of stripes across the tops of her shoulders, indicated that she was pro probably fr from the planet HL-37 in the Gorgon galaxy. She came aboard the Galileo III, three when it, it really was a cargo holder. She was captured as a young girl, unsure of whom or exactly when, but she was handed over to the captain of the Galileo III when her owner couldn't play, pay a gambling fee he owed him. It must have been a huge amount because the captain of the Galileo beat him nearly into oblivion with, with a pinwheel wrench, wrench right in front of her. What can you do? He asked Harmony in a gruff and an emotionless voice as he kicked the pile of flesh that was once her owner into the space dock, then shut Galileo's hatch. She quickly scanned the interior of the ship, flipped a few switches and figured out the neutral drive was leaking energy, causing a slight lag when the thrusters were used. From that moment on, Harmony became Galileo's overprotective mother, and she was for forever finding ways to improve her baby's performance keep her camouflaged up, and when necessary, win a fight against the neighborhood bully, ensuring that bully would never bother her again. In space, the Galileo blended in into the stars unnoticed. Silently, she cruised the galaxy like a wallflower, envying the speed of we or weaponry of the showboats that sailed in plain view. She watched from miles away the paths of other vehicles, the space stations that were safe, the ones crawling with IPF, and any planets that had excessively excessive activity in their atmosphere. But like the, the Trojan horse of Earth-1 history, any alien craft that took more than a second to cast a, a casual glance at their radar would see under the hood the pulse of a wild beast. It took several years for Harmony to make Galileo one of the most notorious and hunted pirate ships in space. The problem for the IPF and anyone else searching for this elusive ship was that no one, else, no one knew for sure what it looked like. When larger ships were torn apart, their cargo stolen, captain murdered, and the ship left to drift helplessly along with only a prayer in, a hall, in the hull, and some kinder crew would hear the distress signal. Any survivors, of which they, they were usually none, would remember a huge ship with a monstrous crew who slaughtered anyone who they saw. More often than not, when a captain tried to regain control of his vessel, he would be boarded by savages, brandishing weapons ranging from razor-sharp turnish, turmish massacre swords to IPF-issue carousel chamber pistols, to flamethrowers. A ship that met with the Galileo was often found by IPF stripped. The captain and the first mate found floating along the outside of the vessel, ropes tied around their necks to any other fixture. It was enough to cause nightmares among even the most seasoned veteran of the IPF. The eyes would be almost completely out of their sockets and their throats would be covered in scratches as the victims desperately clawed at their skin in a useless attempt to breathe air. Their, their hands would be frozen claws, and any blood that seeped from their ears and nose would be frozen solid, like their bodies. And when they were, were finally retrieved from their black floating grave, when these gruesome casualties were were finally this delivered to the nearest morgue, the staff would always note how the eyes stared endlessly as the bodies thawed, but the terror never seemed 
to leave the face. If a smaller ship was hijacked, the crew usually hid, giving up the booty and then giving the IPF a plain description of a cargo holder with no distinguishing features and a crew of men, also no distinguishing features who stole all their other goods. However, they might escape with their lives, but never without a severe beating from any one of Galileo's crew members. Usually it was Fecho. He was a high-strung Otarian who had a chip on his immense shoulder and took any art op opportunity that came his way to punish the individuals who made him mad. And everyone who wasn't a member of the Galileo made him mad. It was a few years ago that he saw two guys arguing in space dock at the SETI-5 space station. One was a tall guy, obviously upset about not getting every penny he thought he deserved. The other guy was a short, round fella, with eyes that seemed to, too close together. Fecho had just come a, off a bender from a cantina around the corner. His blood was boiling as his head pounded. He thought he thought of the female he had met the night before. She was a beautiful Italian, petite, with huge brown eyes, huge brown tits, and she kept up with him, drink for drink until he, he was sure he'd be giving it to her in the alley before long. But the last thing he remembered was the room spinning and her sweet little face smiling at him. He woke up with his money gone and his ego in tatters. When he saw the two men arguing in the space dock, he was just about just going to his own way, going to go his own way, but then he saw a third guy sneaking up with a bar in his hand. Someone was going to get cre creamed, and two against one just wasn't how tough guys fought. And Fecho, if he th was nothing else, was a tough guy. He charged the third guy, tackled him, and pounded his face until the muscles in his arm burned. Then he stood and kicked the poor slob in the gut until he himself couldn't breathe and nearly collapsed in exhaustion. The taller guy was now holding the little guy by his collar. He was pulling money from his pockets. With one swift movement, the taller man tilted his head back, then snapped it forward, letting his forehead crack open the little guy's nose, and then crump to the guy, to the floor, in agony. What's your name, boy? The taller man asked Fecho as he counted the money he had just taken from the little worms wriggling at their feet. Fecho. He extended his hand as his, he his chest heaved up and down. There was nothing like a brawl to clear a man's head. He thought to himself as he wiped a river of sweat from his forehead. My name's Ness. I got a ship I could use a little help on. You interested? The man handed, handed half the bills he pulled off the little guy to Fecho. For your trouble. Fecho smiled. Yeah, yeah, I'm interested. What else can you do? I mean, besides tenderized meat. I can, uh, run a loader. I can, uh, I can... Can you fly a ship? Fecho nodded excitedly. Yeah, yeah, I can fly a ship. I can fly a SP-18, a horizon cutter, a 34 transport port module, your basic cargo holder. Uh, I got the picture. I need a co-pilot for my cargo ship. You'll do. Together they walked to the Galileo, where Harmony was underneath, on her knees encouraging the new warp pores she had installed. They were illegal in most parts of the galaxy because they gave the user an immeasurable advantage over the adversary. Light speed was two fractions of a decimal point slower than the speed generated by these warp cores. Sometimes the amount of time is all that will decide between life or death. This is Harmony. She's my engineer. Ness said casually as she as he went to enter the ship. Fetchel looked her up and down, licked his lips, and adjusted his pants around his waist. I'll bet. I'm Fetchel. He reached a hand out to shake her shake, but it hung there, awkwardly alone. Don't worry, sweetness. Otarians don't bite. Harmony's eyes twitched slightly as she looked at Fecho. After a minute, she stood up and towered over him. Her face held no expression. She said nothing as she pushed past him and entered the ship. Fecho shook it off and followed her into the airlock. 
She could feel his eyes on her as she walked ahead of him. Typical, she thought of, of to, to herself. Every man, male of just about every species looked at her the same way. It gets a little boring after a while. Harmony led Fetch through the, through the hold, down the short corridor to the bridge where she stopped. Herc, take care of this new, new, newbie. Sure, Herm. Hercules was Ness's first mate and best friend since childhood. He was as big as the mythological character, with precisely chiseled muscles over every part of his body. He also looked down to meet Fetcho's gaze. What the hell are they feeding you, all you, all you guys on this ship? Fetcho asked, trying to be funny. Spinach, Hercules said seriously. He reached out a hand. Welcome aboard the Galileo 3. We're going to be getting out of here soon. What does Ness want you to do? Fetcho wasn't sure what spinach was as he stared at Herc's giant club-like hand engulfing his own in a welcome shake. Uh, he said he needed a coal, needs a coal pilot. Well, get your ass on the bridge and wait for him to tell you what to do next. Fetcho, feeling brave after meeting the crew, boldly pulled Herc a little closer to him before letting go of his hand. This guy, Ness, what kind of captain is he? Herc pursed his eyebrows together in a stern look. He's the kind who doesn't make take any shit. Well, uh, I mean, does he pay well? I mean, does he give each crew member a share? You know, a piece of the pick pie? <coughs> Excuse me, I'll have a little cold. <coughs> Herc looked seriously at the rookie and saw a twitch in the little man's eye he wasn't sure he liked. You get whatever you... He poked Fetcho in the chest. Bring aboard. Again, Fetcho just stood there a little confused. It took him a, a while to learn his place. And he learned soon enough that the Galileo 3 was no luxury cruiser out to make quick hits for a few gems. This was real work for big payouts and the job was no, not easy nor for the weak of heart. They didn't just find scrap metal or sell a few dozen bags of liquid narcotics. No, this was hardcore. Captain Piper Ness was an ex-inmate of the IPF prison planet Virus 4. The prison was not designed for rehabilitation, Rehab was an antiquated way of thinking of things. No, this was designed to break an individual down, no matter what species, till the thought of returning to the planet for another stint would cause such anguish they would go straight. The truth was, if someone were bad enough to get sentenced there, even for... Excuse me. Even for a brief amount of time, by the time they were released, it would take an exorcism to get the evil out. Many men and many women who were sentenced to life on Virus 4 were driven insane as their minds could no longer take the brutal conditions. Since the entire planet was the prison, there was no worry about escape. If an in inmate felt he could no longer st stay within the the confines of the housing units. There wasn't a guard assigned to the prison that would stop them. There were trails of skeletons, the remains of those who, would, who tried to find peace or freedom or by walking away. They soon succumbed to the brutal elements caused by two sons, not to mention that the only life forms that made virus for their home were inedibly, inedible thorn beetles that secreted poison. That poison could kill a wharf buffalo from the neighboring planet of Jinx within five minutes. For those lifters, lifers, a uh, hopelessness would settle into their bones and then the mind would just give up. There was only one landing station and each drop-off pickup of inmates was made every three hours. Only authorized ships were allowed on the surface. Any authorized vessels would be given one warning before each shot out of the sky. 
and since inmates were delivered and removed every day, the housing units would sometimes become overcrowded. With a quick transmission to IPF, the inmates would be chosen at random to start building more units. The inmates would work continually in shifts. Work stopped for absolutely nothing. Some, someone fell into the hardening solution. Kept, keep working. An inmate gets electrocuted hitting a live underground wire. Keep working. An unstable wall collapsed on four inmates and they all, they, they all are all dead. Keep working. There were enough men to replace the ones who died on the job without skipping a beat. One new housing unit contained 300 individual units. The individual units were just small square rooms with no doors, a shelf with a thick mat thin mattress for a bed, a toilet, and a sink. More often than not, when the buildings were complete, they stood empty for a while because no so many inmates expired during the construction process. Then, as if magically, overcrowding was no longer a problem. The planet was barely touched by the IPF, so that so there would be plenty of room for expansion in the future. Riots were not common, but they did happen. The virus for riot of 2633 was probably the worst, and Captain Ness had just arrived barely having time to break in his bunk when all hell broke loose. He had been sentenced to seven years hard time for slave trading and smuggling liquid narcotics. When the riot started, there were 11,985 inmates. <coughs> when it was over, when it was over 6,600 uh, hours later, there were 8,742. Every member of the prison staff were unarmed, unarmed due to, the, to a rule in the prison's code that states every staff member who does not retreat immediately to the safe house during, during a riot will be immediately terminated from his position and will receive no benefits, pensions, or perks, written or verbal, <coughs> from the IPF or its subsidiaries. The safe house was an impenetrable fortress that was stocked with food, water, computers, weights, saunas, a swimming pool, and dozens of other amenities for the men to enjoy, while on the outside the inmates killed themselves. It was also a rule for the guards to leave the bodies of the dead where they lay. The inmates were told to clean up their own mess and bury the deceased. However, they were not given any kind of tools to dig, so... Uh, with the, so the majority of bodies were tossed around the perimeter of the facility to be dried out by the suns. The walk from the landing pad to the... Pardon, that was my email notification. I'll take a break from that. The walk from the landing pad to the front of the prison was called Eternity alley because whether a person was there for a couple year of years or for life the stint felt like eternity it was a freakish sight for the new arrivals to see the white bones or rotting corpses of what were a few hours ago fellow inmates some individuals would break down right there crying in their native tongues for their mothers others would try and look tough but the fear in their eyes as they looked at the bodies would cause the color of the, to drain from their cheeks. When the riot alarm f went off, Captain Ness guarded his cell as if he as if, uh, if he had solid gold bars stacked to the ceiling instead of a, just a bunk with a couple pictures taped to the wall. One big brute of a known origins tried to muscle his way in. The excitement. Of, of so much chaos feeding his animal tendencies. He saw Ness simply as raw meat. His bald head was coated with gross albino scales that glistened sickeningly under a thick layer of some secretion, and his eyes were lifeless white pits. He screamed at Ness incoherently and charged, pinning him against the wall and knocking every bit of air out of his lungs. The monster's thick arms encircled Ness around his, the waist, and he began to feel the intense pain of being squeezed. If he didn't do something, his ribs would be cracked, and then he would be more than vulnerable. 
Ness took his thumbs and drove them straight into the beast's eyes and held on with all his strength. Black blood oozed from the wounds, and the screaming sound was sharp and piercing in Ness's ears as it cried in pain. But Ness would not let go. Instead, he dug deeper and thrashed and jerked, but still Ness hung on. Deeper and deeper he pushed. The beast fell to its knees, yet still grab it, grabbed on Ness's hands, trying to pull them away from the mutilated tissue that was once his eyes. Still Ness kept pushing. Finally, as Ness fell, that uh, that he was sure uh, was the opposite side of the creature's skull underneath the thumb, his thumb, the beast completely collapsed in a gross mass of quivering flesh. It twitched once or twice, but the life was gone. Ness grabbed it by its feet and dragged it out of the cell. Several of the inmates r watched the battle between the two. When they realized that the giant had been slain by a human who dug his eyes out, they left Ness alone in his cell. One tried to cozy up to him, looking for protection. His name was Otis, and he was a scrawny, shifty guy from the Lotus Galaxy, and for trying to smuggle into a neutral uh, zone space station, even seven baggies of nar liquid narcotic inserted into his anus. He thought he could go as far as if Ness was around him. Hey, psst, buddy, he hissed. His voice was oily and dripped of selfish intentions. Hey, that was some good fighting there. Ness was sitting on his bed trying to catch his breath, while every nerve jumped on edge at, as his new ver vermin came into his cell. Yeah, Otis stepped carefully, as if he were tr avoiding landmines or piles of dog shit. I never seen a guy fight like you. That was beautiful, man. Really? A thing of beauty. Ness watched him as he checked out his cell. It was like he was considering a new location for his new own business. To the look on Otis's face, his unit would, ju would, ju would do just fine. You know, we could help each other out. Somewhere in the prison, several painful screams came, followed by yelling and crashing. It was mass hysteria out in the other areas, but the moment Ness's corner was quiet and almost empty. Yeah, we could help each other. Each other. Yeah, see, I can, I can get things for you. I know how to talk with the guards. I can get you anything you want. Liquid narcotic, Jack Daniels. Otis looked and saw the three pictures hanging on the wall. Leaning in closer, he smiled a disgusting, sleazy smile. Ness straightened. Suddenly his ribs didn't, ribs didn't hurt so much. Well, tell me how you fucked that. Tell me you just, you had just that, tell me you had that juicy piece right there. He looked at Ness with lust in his eyes while rubbing his hands on his thighs. On the wall was a picture of a girl, no older than thirteen. Looking back at, at the picture, he licked his lips. You gotta tell me about it. I gotta know. Otis turned his head to talk to Ness, but instead was knocked to the floor. His eyes bugged as he looked up at the towering figure in front of him. He raised a hand to defend himself as a giant claw reached down and grabbed him around the throat. Ness yanked him to his feet and squeezed his throat with his left hand as he whispered to his ear, in his ear, Stay away from me. He grabbed Otis's right arm with his free hand and in one swift moment, movement snapped it behind his back. The crack of the bone echoed in the small cell and Otis's eyes filled with tears as he gasped for air. Ness walked out of his cell, half carrying, half dragging Otis to the corridor where he slammed his head into the wall, driving his point home. Otis crumpled to the floor. He was still breathing, choking a good bit and spitting up bile while his right arm rested unnaturally behind his back. He began to crawl down the corridor, whimpering and muttering obscenities as he did. After that, Ness never saw him again. Rubbing his ribs and breathing deeply, Ness walked to the bed and sat down. He looked down over at the pictures of the girl on the wall, his daughter. In one of the photos, she was outside of, of her home at her home on Earth 2. 
The leaves of the trees were gold behind her, and the sun shone on her long brown hair, highlighting it with gold streaks. Her bold, bl her blue eyes tw twinkled from beneath long black lashes. She had his blue eyes. The picture was worn and wrinkled around the edges. The other two were of her when she was a little baby. baby. In one, she was wrapped up in blankets, sleeping with a little snowman next to her. In the other one, she was in the arms of someone whose image had been ripped off. Her mother. Ness never had good luck with women. He liked the sex and the attention. Sometimes he would feel a twinge that would make him think of cashing in his chips to become domesticated. He had money stashed all over the galaxy, certainly enough to set up a nice little life for him and the right woman. The problem was that he didn't believe in the right woman. And when his daughter's mother looked to her, Earth too was without telling him. She, w she went ballistic. Since then, he punished every woman he was with. To him, it seemed to be, he seemed, the crueler he was, the more women wanted to stay with him. It didn't matter. If he cheated, if he beat them, if he stole from them, they would insist on coming back for more. In a way, Ness got a sort of sick pleasure out of it, feeling in control, playing God. But the truth that he buried deep down in his belly was that no matter how much pain he inflicted on the females in his life, he would break down and cry like a baby to hear his daughter call him daddy just one more time. The last time he spoke to him, when he received this picture, she called him Ness. He had written to her. They were lame letters full of sorry and mistake and I love you. She wrote back many times reassuring them him that it was for the best, that she was doing fine and that she would see him soon. Ness wasn't sure if it, if it was the way the little, this little girl, girl seemed so old in her letters or if it was that he was weakening, but he wanted to go to her to be a father, but then reality would pound on him harder than any enemy ever had or would. What would he tell her? That he steals ships, kills the crew, sometimes rapes the women and sells them into their to the flesh trades? That the crew of his own ship have murdered and stolen most of the time just for sport? That he had bags of liquid narcotic in the cargo sh hold of his ship? That he bribes IPF officers? Are these the stories he would tell as he tucked her into bed at night? No. Ness wouldn't go to his daughter right now. Not right now. Besides, she was no longer an awkward little 13-year-old. She was 22 and living on the space station 108 that floated lazily around Earth 2. It was a transient station. Lots of coming and goings and not all of it good and and wholesome but what could Ness do he couldn't tell her where he where to live he could not he could just promise help if she needed it if only she needed help if only she would contact him and tell him she was in a bind or needed some fi funding or that she missed him but it never happened how could she miss a man she didn't know even if he was her father the memory of the last time she spoke to him scrambled up to the front of his mind like a spider out of its on its web. Okay, well I gotta go. Talk to you later, Ness. Goodbye, Amber. The Galileo three was now silenced, silently making its way toward the Red Sigma quarter in a near neutral part of the Lotus Galaxy. After Hercules intercepted a transmission that indicated a personal luxury vessel had, had decided to go slumming in uncharted territory, the Galileo was in pursuit. Fetcho, how soon until interception of the, end of the ship? I'd say no more than 15 ticks. Plenty of time to get prepped. Herc, make sure the weapons are ready. Depending on who's on board, I don't know if we'll, if we'll need prisoners. Alrighty on it. Harm, 
think we are ready to try out that shiny new toy you installed? Harmony had managed to camouflage the pin laser underneath the bridge viewing screen that shoots an almost unnoticeable line of light onto any area of the ship for, from over 100,000 meters away. The idea behind this was to puncture an airlock, fuel tank or radiation monitor just enough so the opposing ship issues a distress call. The ship would now be crippled because the crew would not be able to find the tiny breach that caused them to drift. Not able to see uh, the real cause of the malfunction would cause panic, and the panicked crew was more easily controlled. Yup, yup. It's ready to go. Just give the word. On my mark, Ness watched a Harmony as Harmony flipped a few switches, ready the joystick, and punched in the coordinates of, on the engineering console. He looked out into the blackness that was space, knowing the other ship was out there. It was at this time that all of other thoughts left him. He was the captain of the Galileo Three, a pirate of legendary proportions, and his crew was an ensemble of monsters in their own right who feasted on the spoils and after tasting the blood wanted more. Three, two, one, mark. The laser hummed and gently vibrated the console as Harmony helped guide the line to the coordinates of the other ship. A red thread could barely be seen in the viewing screen as it emerged from the Galileo and disappeared into space. Harmony, Harmony checked her numbers and the radar images of the Red Sigma quarter noted where the luxury ship was located. Flying on course, as she studied the image, her hand gently moved, moving the joystick, she saw a jump in the heat level of the laser. Whoa, gotcha, you son of a bitch. On the radar, the luxury ship sopped and started to drift in no particular pattern. Harmony had successfully crippled the ship by causing a tiny leak in the radiation tanks that helped control the motion of the ship. They were dead in space. Okay, boys, hold on tight. The Galileo was now going to speed into the wound, wounded ship's vicinity. Respond to their distress signal and offer help. Then climb aboard and kill everyone. This ought to be a good play payday. Good job, Harm. Stay with the ship. She nodded as Ness uh, to Ness as the prep began. Let's suit up. Ness walked off the bridge in Hercules with Hercules and Fecho behind him. They put on the air processor mask, grabbed their weapons, and waited for Harmony's signal. Over the wires came the distress call, just like the clockwork. Damn, I am so good, Harmony said aloud to himself. Opening the frequency, she spoke to the other ship. This is Mo with the IPF Cargo Transport Division. You're ha you having some trouble down there? Over. Roger that, Mo. We aren't sure what went wrong, but we are glad to hear from you. We seem to have lost all control of the boosters. Over. The boosters are fine, you asshole. It's your radiation tanks, Harmony said to himself. Well, tell me how you got, how many you got with you, and we'll make sure it make some room in case we have to tow you over. Roger, we got myself, my first mate, four ladies, and three gentlemen who are celebrating their retirement from the IPF. Over. Retired IPF soldiers brought in top dollars in the slave arena because of their size and muscles, but they were hard to take down. Captain, we got IPF on board. Ness nodded his head. You heard the lady. Riot gear and subdue by any means necessary. Well, folks, we're we're uh, that's we're going to read chapter two next time, but that's all the time we have for this episode. Um, thanks for um, thanks for watching me read Outlaws, Nick Sand, chapter one. This is by Nick Sand. He's a science fiction author, and um, if you enjoyed re uh, hearing the sample of the book, make sure you uh, download uh, and purchase his ebook on Kindle. Uh, Amazon.ca, and there's a link below the, the video where you can download and uh, purchase the move the book book for your own enjoyment. I'm going to um, read another chapter in our day, so stay tuned. This is the Meat Geek Gab Show. I'm the Meat Geek, and you're watching official video videos representing AsifNetwork.com. I appreciate it. if you would like this video, add it to your favorites, leave comments, and subscribe. It's Meat Geek signing out till later. Thanks for watching.
Hi, uh, this is the Meat Geek speaking, uh, owner of official video videos representing AsafinNetwork.com. I'd like to thank you for watching my gameplay and game related, uh, geeky related video, whatever it has been. Uh, thank you for watching this uh, video and I'd appreciate if you would support my channel by subscribing, liking, adding this video to your favorite list, leaving comments and sharing it on such social networks as Facebook, Twitter, Bebo, uh, MySpace, as well as many other uh, social networks. Also bookmark my blog, videogamersoasis.com slash blog, and like my Facebook fan page, Video Gamers Oasis. Don't forget to follow me on Twitter, VGO underscore tweets, and click the other links below this video. And me geek. Signing out to later. Thanks for watching. Official VGO video.